The overarching question I think that this entire meeting raises, and that is from a therapeutic perspective, not so much from a scientific perspective, because I think scientifically the link between obesity and cancer is a good one, but from a therapeutic perspective, is this relationship non-trivial in the sense that if obese people are so messed up in so many different ways, physiologically, that the only real solution is they can't be obese. If, they, if you want to do something about their cancer risk, then that may be less interesting for us from a therapeutic perspective. Are there deeper, more profound connections that can be exploited? I think I, I, think I showed my bias. That I do think it can be disconnected. I think we need a better understanding of what, what's underlying the obesity cancer uh, link to, to be able to do that. Um, either by diet approaches, by you know, there's lots of phytochemicals that tickle these, some of these some of these same pathways, uh, or or pharmacologic approaches. But I think definitely there's there's a clearly a strong connection. Uh, I think in, in terms of prevention, uh, disconnecting this uh, this link is going to be a is a huge impact on uh, cancer rates in the future. As as Craig Thompson said yesterday, it's it's you know obesity's gone beyond smoking as public health enemy number one in cancer. I would just like to add to that the ways, the, the mechanisms by which cancer may be linked to obesity is not always the same for every tumor type. So there's no single magic bullet drug treatment that one can conceive of. I think we're really talking about a continuum of obesity or excess adiposity. BMI is a very poor measure of that. I personally have a BMI of um, 24, I believe, I think that since I'm 18, I was 18, I gained something like eight kilograms. Um, I, I'm afraid that this is not all muscle uh, that was created by that. Um, and I think what is often called the normal weight but metabolically obese people are also people that have an excess of body fat. It's simply not measured well. So it's not another population uh, for whom you could learn something by observing the obese. It's just part of the obesity problem as well, but going unnoticed. Um, we need better measures, um, assessing what the total quantitative effect really is uh, of the adiposity cancer connection. And here I'm totally with you. Um, I do think that the projections, population more fraction estimates, for example, of the kind that in a, in a superficial way I presented, um, might well uh, present gross underestimates of what the overall adiposity effect on health is. But obesity is also impacting response to chemotherapeutic agents. Um, resistance, actually we're seeing in our animal models, de novo resistance in, in obese animals to many uh, uh, endocrine therapy and, and chemotherapeutic uh, regimens. Um, some of the mTOR pathway seems to be involved in that too. We can reduce some of that, uh, that resistance. But I Are think- Are you referring to a resistance to to, to, to triggered apoptosis of cancer cells? It, you know, it seems like it's crossing because we're seeing it with tamoxifen and, and, and AIs and breast cancer. We're seeing with, with uh, uh, you know, some, some of the, uh, the, the you know, cell death inducers and pancreatic and other, other cancers. So I think that's another issue we don't necessarily talk about, but on a therapeutic side, this is a problem. Obese, obese individuals are likely to be less responsive to many therapeutics. And this is something we've got to, again, disconnect. Given that there's a correlation between obesity and cancer, or at least there seems to be one, do obese patients for particular cancers have those cancers metastasize in a different way to different preferred organs and tissues than patients who are not morbidly obese? Well, the target organs are the same but the, uh, the rates of metastases and the rates of death are higher. So uh, there's no change in distribution. There's no change in distribution. It's reasonable to think that hyperinsulinemia may be a major factor in causing cancer in people who are obese. So we have to think about what we can do about this. The first thing that we can do is to have clinicians measure insulin. And it's very rare that that happens. I, I think that uh, knowing insulin is important for the patient. 
And, and uh, so in general, even in the diabetes field and the pre-diabetes field, insulin is rarely measured in patients and it should be measured and told to the patient that this is a risk factor. So that's one thing. I want to make a comment about the term insulin sensitizers. This is really, for me at least, important. When we talk about lowering insulin levels, <coughs> in the setting of systemic insulin resistance in the classic insulin target organs, liver, muscle, fat, we often would refer to a drug like metformin as an insulin sensitizer, something that would facilitate insulin signaling so that therefore the insulin levels would drop. But you have to consider if there is, as, as I think is the case, at a certain stage of development of cancer, a profound influence of uh, insulin on the process of carcinogenesis, you really have to worry about an insulin sensitizer that would sensitize the cancer to insulin. In other words, there's no problem to lower, I mean, uh, when metformin lowers insulin levels, the extent to which it does so by dropping gluconeogenesis, and so therefore insulin falls secondarily, that's, that's okay. But if you had an insulin sensitizer that would actually uh, facilitate insulin signaling in the cancer, then any advantage of the lower circulating insulin level would be, uh, would be uh, nullified. I think there really is a semantic problem. I mean, insulin sensitizing may need to be defined. Um, sometimes it's used fairly loosely just to say we can obtain the same blood glucose with lower insulin levels. That may be because something promotes glucose uptake into peripheral tissues through an AMP kinase-dependent mechanism or other. It may be because it changes hepatic glucose output, changes circulating fatty acids that are going to change insulin action on the liver. So I don't think you should get locked into thinking insulin sensitizing means changing insulin signaling. Furthermore, I will say that Promoting insulin signaling through certain pathways is beneficial for cancer. Through other pathways, it's not. So the point has been made that even in the classic insulin-resistant state, insulin drives SREBP1C expression in the liver, and you get a fatty liver. So all insulin sensitization doesn't affect all insulin pathways the same way. So if you think insulin signaling is bad for the cancer, I think you need to be specific about which branches of insulin signaling. Agreed. I just had two comments. The, f the first one is just as a, a, a pundit, as a non-oncologist, and that is the, the idea of uh, treating cancer in uh, obese people, to me, is illogical. You have to treat the obesity because the ob person who's obese is in trouble uh, for multiple reasons. Second comment is um, regarding uh, uh, the, the relationship between calorie restriction and, uh, and, and cancer. I mean, I, I think that uh, I just want to point out that calorie restriction has other effects besides endocrine effects, and there are many cell autonomous effects of calorie restriction. And with respect to the sirtuins, there's a particularly interesting fact. Uh, if you look at the, the relationship between SIRT1 and cancer has always been somewhat complicated and tortured. And if you, uh, the best reading of the literature uh, that I could make at this time is that SIRT1 is a tumor suppressor for uh, uh, most tumors except for two. And one is prostate cancer, where there's pretty good data that it, it dri it's a driver. And prostate cancer, and the other for which there's not as good data, but data is glioma. The issue of trying to deal with the increased cancer risk related to obesity, uh, as distinct from the treatment of obese cancer patients, I've already said that my perspective is, you know, sure, everybody should become thin, but that's actually not a realistic short-term goal. So that, I think, is the core large problem. I mean, what, because we can't propose drug intervention therapies for, you know, the half of the U.S. population that is obese. Uh, 
and, and so I think that's actually almost an unsolvable problem, and it will take a longer-term solution. It's going to be a policy question, and it's going to re require policies and patience because there's not going to be a policy that will be, uh, have a quick payback, and sadly, there'll be people who will be fighting the policies that can be justified medically. There seems to be this correlation between how we're increasing our processing of foods and how we're making these inexpensive processed foods and compared to what we used to eat. And maybe if we could change policies on what we're feeding the rest of the world and the Western world, um, could we get at that question of obesity that way? I mean, does that make sense? You have to think about lessons learned from the tobacco program and tobacco policy changes that have been experienced in our country and in other countries as well. It's a slow process, but first, by generating the kinds of substantive evidence to be able to sway the decision makers that make these policy decisions to go along the uphill battle, because you're going against the grain with economic forces, economic climates that are very strongly subsidized within our current environment. So there are ground forces looking to reframe that whole equation. And I think a lot of it, again, will continue to be driven by the economic cost value. Let's suppose that we could choose between calorie restricting everybody, all right, so that they're 20% they're lower than, than what, what's, what's considered to be the, the caloric uh, requirement, or putting everybody on a low carbohydrate diet, but with an identical amount of calories to what they normally consume, all right? Which would have a bigger impact on cancer? It would, the question you asked is even more interesting because we know that calorie restriction has such a large effect, but what we don't know is whether that effect is independent of the carbohydrate restriction that happens in the calorie restriction. So for instance, if you look at the primate studies of calorie restriction that have been published so far by Rick Weindrick's group at the University of Wisconsin, for instance, he sees some effect from calorie restriction in his primates, but the diet they're using is 20% sucrose and I think 40% cornstarch. And then you could ask the question, is the effect they're seeing from restricting total calories or is the effect they're seeing from restricting sugar and carbohydrate calories, which are also being restricted. So one of the things we're hoping to do is get researchers, when they do experiments in calorie restriction, to somehow do a carbohydrate restriction ad libitum arm as well, so they could start teasing out which one of these two is the, actually having the effect, instead of assuming de facto that if they restricted calories, that's what did it. Everybody's right here. I think total calories is, is is still a good target, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Is, is the best way to do that, to, we've got to cut something out, um, is the best way to do that to limit carbohydrate? Probably, maybe, um, I think it's a good research question and, and one we're, we're starting to go down. So that's, uh, I, I think th it's been a useful conference in that. I think it's crystallized some good, good thinking on that. It has indeed been a beautiful conference. I think one of the most stimulating I've attended in a long time.